I really hate to do this now, but it's the wrong speaker up here tonight. You've got to be Daniel. <laughs> Brother, you'd have, if you weren't here earlier, you're going to have to find out what happened. Okay, but they've still got to find out what happened. <laughs> Brother Don Carbett has, we've known him, well, I don't know how long, back since I first went to Southwest, known for his ability and and faithfulness to the cause of Christ and willingness to stand up against error and expose it and uphold the truth. He's a native of La Mesa, Texas. He attended Freed Hardeman College in the 1950s. He's done local work in New Mexico, Arizona, and Oklahoma. He now preaches for the Penn and A congregation in Atoka, Oklahoma. And he also operates classic memorials in Denison, selling memorial stones as well as pre-need funerals for an area funeral home. He's managed the El Paso lectures for several years. I think that was one of the first times I was involved with you besides Southwest, I believe. Made some 16 mission trips to Africa and Scotland, toured the Bible land twice, helped establish the West Coast School of Preaching in Ghana, West Africa, and it's now a thriving conservative school. Has authored a commentary on Revelation, another book with the string, and more recently, Ravening Wolves and a Roaring Lion, a book dealing with belief in God to counteract the work of, as he says, stupid professors in the classroom. He's wrote, uh, written some uh, 35 religious tracts and out of print. We want to see what we can do about that. He debated John Edwards. I was uh, able to attend that one. And Dan Billingsley on the divorce question dealt with their errors very well. He's married to Jewel, who they married in 2011. And together they have uh, six children, 11 grandchildren, three great-grandchildren. We're very pleased to have him with us and to come to speak to us on Christ's confronted error about forgiveness. Brother Don, come speak to us. It's indeed a pleasure to be here tonight and to receive a proper introduction. <laughs> been a wonderful week for those of us who have had part in this. We appreciate the opportunity to help spread the word of God at home and abroad by all the means being used by this good congregation. We thank the elders, we thank the Stevens for the hospitality and Grateful to David Brown for all the good work that's being done here. Christ did make many th statements about forgiveness. He did teach on this subject. Several times this week we've had reference made to Matthew 18 in regard to discipline in the church and how that a brother would be brought back to redemption, to salvation. Probably this is what provoked the Apostle Peter to come to the Lord and ask a question about forgiveness. Maybe he didn't know exactly how many times we should forgive someone who may have transgressed the will of God. So we ask this question, Lord, how oft shall my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Till seven times. Jesus saith unto him, I say unto thee, until seven times but until 70 times 7. Therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a man, a king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought unto him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife, and children, and all that he had, and payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord of that servant was moved with compassion, and loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him an hundred pence, and he laid hands on him, and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me what thou owest. And this his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. 
So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after he had called him, said unto him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desiredst me. Shouldest not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servant, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was wroth, and delivered him to the tormentors, till he should pay all that was due unto him. So likewise shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, if ye from your hearts forgive not every one his brother their trespasses. Here we have the story of a king taking account of obligations that were due him. He found one servant that owed him a great debt, and he was going to penalize him for that, but he begged for compassion. He received it. This is likened unto God in our relationship to him. Then this man who owed the king this money went out and found someone that owed him some money, and he laid hold on him and put him in prison. He should have not done that because there's no way he could pay the debt in prison. But nevertheless, the Lord or his Lord, the king, heard of this and he took away that forgiveness because this man would not forgive someone else. The Lord does say quite a lot about forgiveness in the New Testament. But this story reminds us of the two realms of forgiveness, divine forgiveness and human forgiveness. The forgiveness we need from God and then the forgiveness we need from one another as we commit sin against a brother or sister. The idea of forgiveness is to restore a relationship that has been broken by some kind of sin or offense. Now, first of all, we want to note that there are several synonyms used for restoring this good relationship between man and God or between man and man. First of all, the idea of forgiveness is the principal word that we're going to consider. This is from the Greek word ephemia, which means to send away. It is associated with sins, trespasses, debts, and offenses in the Word of God. This particular word can be used many times in the Bible, such as forsaking, letting, omitting, or putting away a partner. But here, we're concerned about the sending away of sin, being forgiven. The background of this goes back to Leviticus chapter 16 in the story of the scapegoat. You may remember that the Israelites, upon a certain occasion, were to go out and bring two goats and offer one unto the Lord, and the other goat would be used to send out into the wilderness into an uninhabited land after having prayed over this goat their sins and then send him away. And this suggested the idea of sending away or getting forgiveness for transgressions. Now, before forgiveness can take place, there must be sin. There is sin. We don't have any problem with that because all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Every accountable person who lives upon the earth transgresses the will of God. And thus, everyone who does transgress God's will is in need of forgiveness. The Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 7 explained how when he became accountable to the Lord, the commandment came, it applied to him, and he sinned, and he died. And that's the way it is with all of us. When the Word of God comes to us, pointing out sin in our lives, the Word of God doesn't cause us to sin, but it identifies sin for us. Now, there are several words in the Bible that describe sin or describe forgiveness, such as transgressions. That is one thing that we're concerned about how we get forgiveness of transgressions, but some words that illustrate these kind of transgressions, such as sin, which means to miss the mark, trespass, a false step, a blunder, or to fall away, offense, to cause to stumble, which is used for trespassing, transgress, to cross over. We know we can transgress by going against the will of God, departing from His way. Whosoever transgresseth and abideth not in the doctrine of Christ hath not God. Iniquity, lawlessness or wickedness or unrighteousness would define that word. Then there's the word debt used interchangeably with sin. And then there is the word evil. Now, as we think of these things, we are reminded that there are several words to describe 
the state of our being accepted by the Lord. First of all, there's the word pardon. This simply means to pass over, to hide, or forgive. It is found in the Old Testament some 19 times. In the New Testament, it is not found one single time. In the King James Version, as far as I know, in the American Standard or the New King James. But the idea is there. The idea of pardon or forgiveness. Then there's the word covered as used in the scripture as well, which is used interchangeably with the idea of forgiveness. In Psalms 32 and verse 1, David pronounced a beatitude upon those whose sins are covered and is quoted by the Apostle Paul in Romans 4 and verse 7. Then there's the concept of sins being hidden. This is also that of forgiveness. James 5, 19 and 20 talks about hiding a multitude of sins. Then sins are removed or forgotten or remembered no more. In Jeremiah 31, quoted by the apostle in Hebrews chapter 8, it talks about the new covenant at which time God would remember sins no more. There's the idea of forgiveness. Then sins can be blotted out. Acts 3, 19. Repent ye therefore and turn again that your sins may be blotted out. Also brought to our attention from Isaiah 43 and verse 25. Then there's a state of being justified. The state of being forgiven. Paul wrote to the Corinthians and talked about their previous life. How they had done these things that were sinful. But now they have been justified. They brought, brought salvation from the Lord. 1 Peter 3 and verse 12 the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous, or over the just, those who are justified in his sight. Then there's the word remission, which is the same word for forgiveness. Jesus used this word in Matthew 26, 28. This is my blood which is shed for many for the remission of sins. Then in Acts 2 and verse 38, the apostle Peter used the same term for the remission of sins in reference to what men must do to contact this blood. Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. Then there's the idea of forgiveness, because we have forgiveness in Christ. Colossians 1.13 talks about the kingdom of the Lord in which we've been translated. And then verse 14 says, in whom we have forgiveness of sins, redemption. So we have that forgiveness in Christ. Then there's the most common word that we use, the word saved, relating to salvation. As in the Great Commission, Jesus said, He that believeth and is baptized shall be saved. He that believeth not shall be damned. So it's important then to follow the terms of the Lord if we want to enjoy salvation. On Pentecost Day, when those people heard the word, some 3,000 were baptized that same day and were added unto them. Verse 47 says they were added unto the church, as many as were being saved. So those who had remission of sins were those who were saved and put into the family of the Lord. Then sins can be taken away or removed. David was rebuked for his sin with Bathsheba and Uriah by the prophet who came to him and told him the parable of the ewe lamb. And after he was convicted of sin and realized he had done wrong, he repented and he said, my sin has been taken away. It's been forgiven. Then there's the concept of redemption being redeemed, as if one goes into a pawn shop and hawks an item, he goes back and redeems it. He pays for it to get it back. And that word is sometimes used in reference to our being accepted in the eyes of the Lord. Now, there are two realms of people who need forgiveness. First of all, those who are lost in sin and have never been saved, they've never gotten God's forgiveness. And secondly, those who have been saved and who commit sin after their initial salvation. So first of all, we want to explore the idea of forgiveness for the alien sinner. There are two sides to forgiveness, God's side and man's side. God has done his part, and man must do his part to obtain this forgiveness. What has God done? Well, he loved us. He loved the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that anyone who would believe in him would have everlasting life. Words from John 3 and verse 16. God makes his grace and his mercy available to us. And he has sent the Spirit's message telling us what we need to do. And that began to be revealed as Christ taught the apostles 
and gave them the Great Commission and instructed them previous to that occasion. But primarily in Acts chapter 2 on the day of Pentecost when the power came and the apostles were enabled to speak with tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance, they began to reveal to the public for the first time God's plan of redemption, God's plan of saving man and offering him forgiveness. Peter preached the story of the life, death, burial, resurrection, ascension, and coronation of Christ at the right hand of God and offering salvation unto man. In the third chapter of the book of John, we find Jesus and Nicodemus conversing on a subject that led the Lord to talk about the new birth. Nicodemus had asked him concerning things, and Jesus said, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. Nicodemus couldn't understand that. He understood the physical birth. But the Lord explained how to be born again. Except a man be born of the water and the spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of heaven. The spirit works through his word, the teaching of the Lord. It is said to be the seed of the kingdom, Luke 8, 11. It is the sword of the spirit. Peter had just preached the word to these people, and on Pentecost Day, they heard that word, and they asked what they needed to do, and Peter told them to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they'd receive the remission of their sins. And they were baptized in water. Thus, the work of the Spirit in the seed planted into their hearts, and then the response of water coming forth from the watery grave into the kingdom of our Lord. Now, the Apostle Peter, as well as the Apostle Paul, talks about the concept of the Spirit working in that way. In 1 Peter 1, beginning with verse 21, or 22 rather, Peter said, Seeing ye have purified your souls in obeying the truth, through the Spirit unto unfeigned love of the brethren, see that ye love one another with a pure heart fervently, being born again, not of corruptible seed, but of incorruptible, by the word of God which liveth and abideth forever. Now he talks about the Spirit, through the Spirit, in verse 22, and it's being born again of the incorruptible Word of God, which lives and abides forever. That's the eternal Word. Then he goes on to say, in verse 25, But the Word of the Lord endureth forever, and this is the Word which by the Gospel is preached unto you. Now the writer of this epistle was the same one who on Pentecost Day in Acts chapter 2 told those people what to do to be saved. And now he writes to them and talks about these things in this way. Paul in 1 Corinthians 4 and verse 15 makes mention of the fact that they'd been begotten by the gospel. And that gospel incidentally was the same word that he preached everywhere he went. 1 Corinthians chapter 4 and verse 17 which he preached in every place. If the apostle Paul were to come to this community today and look for a place where he could preach the word and be appreciated, would he find it? Surely he would in this town. But he could not be welcome and would not be welcome if he were to preach what he preached in the first century, in this day and time, in most places today. In most religious bodies, they would expel him from their presence. They would not want the Apostle Paul preaching that kind of message. Now in the second chapter of Acts, something there I'd like for us to explore for a moment. The word save or saved is found three times in this chapter. First of all, it's found in the quotation from the book of Joel by the Apostle Peter. He was explaining the events of that day as the apostles had been able to speak in languages they had not previously learned and studied. And this was an amazing thing as far as the audience was concerned. And they began to make fun of the apostles and so on and to accuse them. But Peter stood up and said, This is that which was spoken by the prophet Joel. And he quotes from Joel 2, beginning with verse 28. And he goes through verse 32. And the 32nd verse is found in the 21st verse of Acts chapter 2 as he finishes the quotation. And here's what he said. And it shall come to pass that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. The last word of this quotation from Joel by the Apostle Peter is the word saved. Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Now at this point, the Apostle Peter gets into the introduction, not just the introduction, but into the body of his message. And he talks about 
the Lord Jesus Christ, a man approved of God by miracles and wonders and signs. And God did approve of him in the midst of those people. And it was him who was delivered by the determinate counsel and foreknowledge of God, and he had been crucified by wicked hands. But God raised him up from the dead. And then he began to quote from the book of Psalms, statements that David had made regarding the resurrection of Christ and how that David foresaw these things taking place. He, he emphasized this quite thoroughly and went on to point out that this one who was raised from the dead was not David because David's tomb was still there. But it was the fact that David was a prophet and knowing that God was going to raise up Christ to sit on his throne talks about him in this way. And that he saw these things before in spite of the resurrection of Christ and finally that he was raised to be at the right hand of God exalted and receive the promise of the Father. And he's pointed out in verse 34 that this was not David because the Lord said, and David is the one who wrote this in Psalm 110, the Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou on my right hand until I make thy foes thy footstool. Now here's the conclusion of his sermon at this point. Therefore, let all the house of Israel know assuredly that God hath made that same Jesus whom you've crucified, both Lord and Christ. Now here he is calling upon them to believe what he said. Let you know assuredly, and that's faith, according to Hebrews 11 and verse 1, that God has done these things for you. Evidently then, if they were believers, they did not need to ask the question. But they did ask a question because they were still troubled. In verse 37, Now when they heard this, they were pricked in their heart, and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, Men and brethren, what shall we do? Then Peter said unto them, Repent and be baptized, every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission of sins. And you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Then he went on to point out in verse 39 that the promise was extended to them and their children and to the Gentiles or those who would be afar off. And with many other words, now Luke the writer records verse 40, what we call verse 40. And with many other words did he testify and exhort saying, save yourselves from this untoward generation. I don't know how many, but he spoke many words after that exhortation. He had been interrupted with their question, what shall we do? Then he went on to explain something in detail as to what they needed to do. Now remember, he told them to repent and be baptized for the remission of sins. Now, as he exhorts them, he uses these words, and this is the second time the word save is found in the chapter. Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Well, did they interrupt and say, now, Peter, what do we need to do to save ourselves? They did not need to ask that question. They would already asked, and he would already given an answer to repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. Now he says, using another language, another term, save yourselves. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized. And the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Now he said, save yourselves. And what did they do? They did what they'd been told previously to do, to arise and be baptized, having their sins washed away. Then we come to verse 47, the last verse of the chapter. It is said, And the Lord added to the church daily such as should be saved. There's the third and last time it's found in this chapter. So those who called upon the name of the Lord would be saved. Verse 21. In Acts 2 and verse 38, they were to repent and be baptized in the name of the Lord. There's that expression, the name of the Lord. And they were calling upon his name by submitting to his authority. This would be the reason why Peter would enjoin upon them the name of the Lord, the authority of Christ. He's the one who authorizes this and commands it. They're submitting to him. They're obeying his will. And they, upon being told to save themselves, were baptized. They submitted to the name of the Lord. Then we're told that those who were saved were added unto them, unto the church. And thus the church is made up of those who are saved by the blood of Christ who have obeyed his word. Anyone who is not a believer, anyone who is only a penitent believer, or anyone who 
has not yet been baptized, immersed in water by the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins is not in the church that he built. He adds the save to the church. There was only one church in that day. Now, the, the emphasis in the scripture is that we must be in Christ or in his church, not out of him nor out of his church to be saved. In 2 Timothy 2 and verse 10, the Apostle Paul pointed out that salvation is in Christ with eternal glory. And Paul said in Colossians 1, 13 and 14 that we have forgiveness in Him. Now, we must get into Him before we can be in Him. Now, in Romans chapter 6 and verse 3, the account given by the Apostle Paul who was converted not on Pentecost Day but sometime later, a few years later, he became a very eloquent teacher and instructor in the way of the Lord and was used by the Holy Spirit to record several books in the New Testament. In verse 3 of Romans 6, he writes to the Roman saints and says this, Know ye not that so many of us as were baptized into Jesus Christ were baptized into his death? Now, he said that they ought to know so many of us he didn't say as many of you, but as many of us. He included himself in this particular statement. Then he goes on to explain, Therefore we are buried with him by baptism into death, that like as Christ was raised up from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. For if we have been planted together in the likeness of his death, we shall be also in the likeness of his resurrection. Notice now that we are baptized into the death of Christ and thus baptized into Jesus Christ. Then we are given the information here that this is a burial with Christ in baptism. The Afrikaans translation says we'll be graved with him. We've been put in the grave with him, so to speak. We're buried with him in baptism and we're raised with him to walk in newness of life. Jesus died for sin. He was buried in the tomb. He was raised from the tomb. We obey that in a likeness. We die to sin. We are buried with Christ in baptism and we're raised to walk in newness of life. And only by being in Him can we be made free from sin, according to verse 18. Now that passage tells us that we get into Christ at the point of baptism. There is one other verse or passage in the New Testament that tells us basically the same thing. This is in the third chapter of the book of Galatians. In verse 26, we find the Apostle Paul, after having talked about the fact that the law that brought them to Christ had been taken out of the way, now faith had come, which replaced the law. The faith that was revealed, not the faith they had in their hearts, but the faith that was revealed. And he said, you're children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. That is, you're children of God by faith, the gospel, rather than the law of Moses. Then he says, you are children of God by faith in Christ Jesus. You have to be in Christ to be children of God. When you are a child of God, you're in Christ. Then he goes on to explain, for as many of you as have been or were, some versions, baptized into Christ, did put on Christ. You are, present tense, now children of God. Well, what did they do? He said, you were baptized. So to be baptized was to put them into Christ where they were children of God. This is something that's hard to get around for those who oppose the teaching of the Word of God on this subject. Now, as we state, Paul included himself. Look at the conversion of Saul of Tarsus, who later became the Apostle Paul. He was told by Ananias to do what? Arise and be baptized and wash away thy sins, calling on the name of the Lord. I've heard it suggested that that meant you couldn't pray till you are baptized. So he was to be baptized and call on the name of the Lord. That's not talking about prayer. In that particular case, it's talking about his calling on the name of the Lord to be saved. His being baptized was the process of calling on the name of the Lord. Now, it was mentioned in Acts 2 and verse 21, here in Acts 22 and verse 16, and in Romans 13, or rather Romans 10 and verse 13, 
and those who called upon the name of the Lord were those who were saved. After they'd heard the word, believed it, then they obeyed by calling on the name of the Lord. Thus they submitted to the authority of the Lord in that sense. Now, secondly, forgiveness for the baptized believer. There are some five conditions that I've listed that I found in the scripture that become conditions for our being saved or being forgiven in our transgression against God or transgressing against one another. One of them is godless sorrow. We're told in 2 Corinthians 7 and verse 10 that godless sorrow works repentance. So in repenting, we need godless sorrow. And we'll get to that in a moment as far as the repentance is concerned. Now, worldly sorrow is that which works death. And that's the kind Judas portrayed in Matthew 27, verses 3 and 4. Now, some are sorry today when they get caught. Some are sorry when they get caught and keep on sinning willfully until they get caught again. That's not the kind of sorrow we need. We need godless sorrow, the kind that is prompted by our relationship and our interest in the God of heaven. Then secondly, there needs to be a confession of sin. We don't confess our sins when we are baptized. We confess our faith in Jesus Christ. But when we transgress God's will, whether we sin against a brother or sister, or we sin against God, and ultimately all sin is against God, we need to confess or acknowledge our wrongdoing. In the 32nd Psalm, David talked about his sin being forgiven and how blessed it was to enjoy that forgiveness. He talked about himself in verses 1 through 5. He said, Blessed is, the, is he whose transgression is forgiven, whose sin is covered. Blessed is the man unto whom the Lord imputeth not iniquity, and in whose spirit there is no guile. When I kept silence, my bones waxed old through my roaring all the day long. For day and night thy hand was heavy upon me. My moisture is turned into the drought of summer. I acknowledged my sin unto thee, and mine iniquity have I not hid. I said, I will confess my transgressions unto the Lord, and thou forgavest the iniquity of my sin. Now David speaks of this not only here in this passage, but in others as well in 2 Samuel 12 and verse 13, how that the Lord had forgiven him. Now criminals, unfaithful mates, seldom want to acknowledge their wrong until it's too late. David was troubled and he was rebuked and prompted to acknowledge his wrong when Nathan, the prophet of God, came to him with a parable of the ewe lamb. Then we have today access to the blood of Christ when we're willing to confess our wrongs. Christ shed his blood for the forgiveness of sins. We contact that blood when we're baptized into the death of Christ where his blood was shed, John 19 and verse 31. Then as Christians, we still have access to that blood. In 1 John 1 and verse 7, John writes, If we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanseth us from all sin. Not too many weeks ago, I heard a preacher talking about this passage, and he said, if we walk in the light, God doesn't even count sin against us. Well, I think that's misleading. If we walk in the light, we're striving to do the right thing, and the right thing to do when we sin is to seek God's forgiveness. And that blood is there. We have access to that blood by walking in the light doesn't mean that we're automatically forgiven just because we're walking in the light and striving to live a good life. But the next verse goes on to say, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And it's that blood of Christ that enables him to forgive us as we confess our wrongs before him. Remember how that the young man who went away from his family, the prodigal son, came back, and he said, I will go back and I'll confess my sins to my father. I'll say, Father, I've sinned against heaven and before thee. Make me as one of thy hard servants. In James 5 and verse 16, James said, Confess your faults one to another and pray for another. The effectual fervent prayer of a righteous man availeth much. Then not only is there the importance of confessing and then repenting of our sins, which as we have already noted is a change of mind, and it is to result in a change of life. Repentance prompts confession. In Matthew chapter 3, when John the baptizer was preaching in the wilderness and telling the people to repent for the kingdom of heaven is at hand, 
we're told that they came to him and confessed their sins. It would seem that there's a close connection between repenting and confessing our wrongs. How can we know that we've repented if we're not willing to acknowledge it? In Acts 8 and verse 22, Peter told this man who had sinned to repent and pray for forgiveness. Repentance there is joined unto prayer as well, and we'll be noting more of that in a moment. We found in Luke chapter 17, verses 3 and 4, the Lord talking about the subject of forgiveness to the disciples and perhaps to the Apostle Peter most of all. Anyhow, he says in this, these verses, Take heed to yourselves, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day, saying, I repent, thou shalt forgive him. So he was confessing his wrongs by saying, I repent. So a confession is an acknowledgement of repentance. Now there must be a forsaking of sins as well, a turning away from them. In Jeremiah chapter 4 and verse 1, God said through the prophet Jeremiah, Return unto me, if thou wilt put away the abomination out of thy sight. So we need to put away sin. If we're going to repent and want forgiveness, we need to forsake that which is evil. We have to turn away from those things. Now today, most people understand what it means to turn away from sin. Most any kind of evil that one may do, he realizes he's got to stop doing it. Except one. And that is, if you've remarried without scriptural grounds because of fornication on the part of a, a mate, then you can keep that mate as long as you just repent of it and go on from there. In Romans 7, verses 2 and 3, as well as in Matthew chapter 19, in verse 9. Matthew 19 and verse 9 is probably the most thorough passage on the subject of divorce and remarriage and the exception of any passage in the New Testament. But I like what Romans 7 has to say as well. Paul in this passage says, For the woman which hath an husband is bound by the law to her husband so long as he liveth. But if the husband be dead, she is loose from the law of her husband. So then if, while her husband liveth, she be married to another man, she should be called an adulteress. But if her husband be dead, she is free from that law, though she be married to another man, though she is an adulteress. God calls her an adulteress because she is married to another man. doesn't mean that you marry someone improperly and you have the first night together and it's not a sin after that because it's all okay. We explored that a little bit yesterday. Now, some make the argument that... Uh, David didn't have to give up Bathsheba when he married her. Therefore, we can do what we want to do today. They argue that he did not have to give up Bathsheba, so neither should they have to give up someone that they've married after they have divorced, not for fornication. And this idea is supposed to be that any time there's an example in the Scripture for our time, like David, that we can follow his example. But it would be an example of what? Had David or Bathsheba been divorced prior to this marriage? Using David improperly is about like arguing that since David used instruments in his singing that we can use them today. Or that if David offered a lamb in sacrifice to God that we can offer lambs in our worship today. Brother Earl Edwards of Freed Hardman makes a statement that I think is significant along this line. Here's a quotation which is in the book. The moment David made Bathsheba his wife she was marriageable according to the law of Moses under which David lived. David sinned in the sex act with Bathsheba and in causing her husband to be killed. It is also true that he showed every sign of sincere repentance. And repentance involved a change of lifestyle. And he goes on to say this. He obviously quit planning murders such as that of Uriah. It is also implied that he quit having sex with the wives of other men. But all of that aside, the main point here is that when he brought her to his house and she became his wife, 2 Samuel 11, 27, she was no longer another man's wife. Therefore, she was marriageable according to the law under which David lived. In fact, neither David or Bathsheba was a divorcee, and they therefore should not be paralleled to divorcees to marry today. I think that's something that you need to consider.
There are three verses that I think are significant when it comes to these kind of thoughts. In Proverbs 17 and verse 15, Solomon said, He who justifies the wicked and he who condemns the just, both of them are an abomination to the Lord. They don't like for us to say that something is wrong that's condemning the innocent. But it's just as wrong to justify the guilty as it is to condemn the innocent. We should do neither. Then in chapter 28 of the book, we have that idea of uh, confessing our sins, forsaking them to be blessed. In Isaiah 55 and verse 7, the prophet wrote, Let the wicked forsake his way, and the unrighteous man his thoughts. Let him return to the Lord, and he will have mercy upon him, and to our God, for he will abundantly pardon. Then there's the idea of prayer. Now, prayer is not a ritual said to gain salvation from our alien sins. One denomination has been in turmoil in recent months and years over the practice of sinner's prayer. The background of this seemingly goes back to the crusades of Billy Graham about 50 years ago. It became popular after that. The sinner's prayer is something like this. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner, cannot save myself. Come into my heart and cleanse me of sin. In Jesus' name, amen. There are many versions of that, but that, in essence, is what it is. Now, notice, here's a prayer to Jesus from one in the name of Jesus, praying to Jesus in his own name. That's really absurd. But nevertheless, there are those who practice it. And many who have opposed that in the denomination of which I speak, the Baptist denomination, have been against it, but they say, well, let's leave it there because this is a good way for people to express themselves. And they really, really voted to just keep it there as a part of it. Now, the doctrine of this denomination is that one is saved at the point of faith. Now, how can one be saved at the point of faith and still ask the Lord to come into his heart and save him? If he asked the Lord to come into his heart and save him, he must already be a believer. Because he addresses him as Lord Jesus and asking for salvation. And yet he's expecting something yet to come. So the whole thing is a contradictory system. Prayer is something that is for the penitent believer. And it's for the penitent person who may transgress the will of God after he is converted. Many more things we could say, but I just suggest you read the book. Salvation is a wonderful thing. Forgiveness of God. It may be that there are some here this evening who have not enjoyed the blessing of salvation from the Lord. You have the opportunity tonight to confess your faith in Christ as the Son of God, repenting of every sin and being buried with Christ in baptism and raised to walk in newness of life. He's the Savior. He will save you. If you're not a child of God, we encourage you this very night to be, prayer, be prepared to meet God in eternity. You can make that preparation now. If you've gone astray, you need to come back and repent and pray for forgiveness. We encourage you to do that. So if you're subject to the Lord's invitation, won't you come now while together we stand and while we sing?